So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the chapter authors, uh, Monette and I will uh, provide a synthesis of the book chapters, and we will do this in three parts. So the first part, uh, we will provide the landscape. So essentially, we will be answering the question, where are we? And then the second part, we will synthesize the evidence. Essentially, we will be answering the question, what are the critical issues? And then the third part, we will summarize the ways forward, essentially answering um, the question, what can be done? So in, on the next slide, in the next slide rather, um, oh, next slide please. So we define we define what is digital economy, and we borrowed from Book and Hicks uh, that says that. Digital economy is the part of the economic output that is derived solely or primarily from digital technologies with a business model based on digital goods or services. So on the left side, um, uh, there's a chart there, and you can see that um, there are three ovals that are inside of each other, uh, which is core, narrow, and broad. So the core would be uh, it, it, it consists of IT, software, telecoms, hardware. And then the narrow, for the narrow definition, it would be the core. And then it, in, it also includes digital services plat and the platform economy. And then the broader uh, digital economy would be sectors like, uh, yeah, of course, core, uh, core plus narrow, and then including sectors like e-businesses, um, e-health, e-commerce, agriculture, and industry 4.0. Um, it's important to emphasize that digital technologies and services are a means to achieve higher social goals. So um, ICT mediates development, and this is recognized in national blueprints, uh, roadmaps, and plans. Um, for example, the Pagtanao 2050, it outlines the strategic plans to harness um, science and technology as tools towards innovation in products, processes, and organization. Um, uh, and and the former DOS, uh, DOST uh, Secretary Fortunata de la Peña uh, mentioned, articulated that um, the Pagtanao 2050 is actually a guiding principle, principle that will enable the science community to assist in shaping the Philippines as a progressive archipelagic nation. Um, there are two important uh, observations to note here. One, uh, the first one would be ICT brought opportunities. And these opportunities uh, comes in the form of social and financial prospects. It has become abundant. It has transformed the interaction and behavior of people, business, and consumers. Uh, work opportunities have also become ubiquitous through labor platforms and um, uh, essentially diverse goods and services abound because of uh, uh, goods and asset uh, platforms. Second observation would be, even though there are opportunities, there are critical issues and challenges. And these challenges uh, what, uh, some of these challenges are organic to innovation itself. Um, organic in the sense that uh, it, innovation is challenging conventional ways of doing uh, businesses and conducting the work and, and conducting and organizing work. And then the the second would be the pace of innovation in the sense that. Um, Essentially, innovation is outpacing reg regulations, challenging le legal and regulatory frameworks, and rendering ICT infrastructures inadequate. So the question is, where are we? In the next slide, um, we note that the economic contribution of the digital economy in the Philippines is significant. In terms of uh, gross value added contribution, in 2018, uh, yeah, it garnered 1.82 trillion uh, pesos, and then in 2021, it's around 1.87 trillion. Uh, that's around 10% of the country's GDP, and this is based on the PSA data. Um, in terms of employment contribution, the sector accounts for around 13% of the country's total employed population, which is 15 years old and above. And this uh, potentially excludes those that are working in the digital labor platforms, which the SAN had estimated to around 400,000. And um, most studies are saying that these uh, figures are likely to, to grow. In the next slide, um, we com uh, we also note that compared with its ASEAN neighbors, the country lags in various digital performance indicators. So you can see there on uh, in the on the table, um, the Philippines ranks low in digital indicators, including digital transformation and trade, connectivity and innovation, and 
um, uh, what is uh, uh, what is uh, really uh, surprising is that we are behind in almost all indicators relative to our ASEAN neighbors. So, in addition, we also note the following three the the following trends. The first trend would be there are gaps in the number of service providers in the country. So, based on the 2019 the uh, DICT's 2019. Um, National ICT and Household Survey, out of the 2,617 sample barangays, only 54% had telecommunication companies, only 36% had telecommunication towers, and around 20% had no internet service providers at all. And then there are also regional disparities in the types of services availed. So for example, NCR households mostly subscribe to fixed broad uh, broadband, rather, and armed households uh, mostly subscribe to mobile broadband. The second uh, trend that we observe is that um, the country has very expensive ICT services. The average price of one gigabyte uh, of data in the Philippines in 2022 was around 1.77 US dollars. So that's uh, around 50, uh, that's around 90 pesos give or take depending on the exchange rate. And this is higher than most of our ASEAN peers, which ranges between 0 0.49 to 1.09 uh, US dollars. In fact, uh, in 2021, we are third among the ASEAN countries with the most expensive ICT service across all ICT price baskets. The third observation that we note here is that there are few uh, secured internet service in the country. So in 2010, the Philippines, alongside other ASEAN countries like Indonesia, Cambodia, uh, Lao PDR, and Vietnam, had less than five secure internet servers per one million people. And then a decade after the secured internet servers have grown in all uh, in all ASEAN member states, but the growth in the Philippines had been the lowest. So just to give you an idea, the Philippines in 2010, we have five secured internet servers per 1 million people. And in 2020, we have 13. Um, in Indonesia, um, they have 1.6 secured servers in, in 2010, and in 2020, it's around 1,877. And in Vietnam, in 2010, they only have uh, they have 2.3 uh, secured servers per uh, 1 million people, and in 2020, it's 105 secured servers. So in the next slide, we note that uh, online services have flourished, but with varying degrees of success across sectors. So there are sectors that flourished, and these include um, e-commerce platforms uh, like Lazada, Shopee, and these add value to customers through promotions, deals, and sales. The government even created e-commerce websites and mobile apps to support the uh, enterprises. Ride hailing and delivery services also flourished because, especially during the pandemic, and also resulting from the pandemic would be uh, the use of digital payment platforms, which rose steeply because uh, people were constrained uh, to. Uh, 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 people need to share from online, uh, offline rather, offline to online transactions. Um, and then in terms of work, more people are engaged in online work uh, as evidenced by the increase in freelancing revenues. And the gig economy in the country will, is uh, actually uh, predicted to continue to grow even after the pandemic and is really expected to thrive. Um, but there are uh, some sectors like the smart city uh, development that requires a more ambitious digital transformation. So currently, it needs institutional and systems-wide ch uh, changes at the national and local levels. So on the next slide, um, we note that there are improvements uh, on the fintech front, in the financial technology front, but much is still desired in financial inclusion. So one of the key improvements on fintech would be the BSP's initiative to make financial transactions interoperable. Um, this includes the PesaNet and InstaPay that allow account holders to transfer uh, funds, money to other banks and non-banks, uh, non-financial institutions rather. And these linkages allow customers to shop, pay bills, and send money conveniently. Um, in terms of challenges based on the BSP financial inclusion survey, the proportion of bank adults increased. So from 2019 to 2020, it has increased by 10.5 percentage points, but still, it's still very low because it's still 30% in 2020. So there are uh, uh, the percentage of bank adults in 2020 is only at around 30%. Um, on the next slide, we also note that 
the policy environment to support digital economic growth, uh, the, sorry, digital economy growth continues to be strengthened. So there are laws on access to credits, uh, funds for entrepreneurship, grants for startups, ease of doing business and efficient government delivery. There are also laws on physical infrastructure, like for example, uh, free internet access in public services and the national ID system. Um, laws also on uh, developing human infrastructures, uh, upskilling, reskilling, digital technology training, uh, laws on innovation like the Philippine Innovation Act. There are also laws that penalize the abuse and mis misuse of ICT, including the Data Privacy Act and the Cyber Crime Prevention Act. On the same slide, uh, we also note that the government introduces different plans and programs to facilitate digital transformation. So with respect to plans and roadmaps, uh, uh, it's listed there, National Broadband Plan, uh, plans related to e-commerce and digital transformation roadmap. With respect to training, there are ton, there are several. Uh, DICT has the D Digital Jobs PH uh, project, which seeks to provide ICT-related training to enterprises, uh, to entrepreneurs and freelancers. Um, DTI also has a portfolio of of training programs that provide on-demand training to enhance uh, and, uh, the uh, MISMIS digital competencies in online selling. TESDA also have uh, training programs that provide digi digital job seekers and business-minded people with digital skills training. DOST also has the LODI project that provides internship um, opportunities to DOST scholars taking up IT courses. With respect to infrastructure, uh, infrastructures, there are also um, uh, several um, programs. We have the Tech for Ed, which is essentially a shared um, service facility that provides ICT enabled services in communities with minimal or no access to information and government services. We have the free Wi Fi, we have the ICADIWA. And then the DICT had launched the Digital Cities 2025 program, uh, which promotes expanding the IT BPM hubs outside major urban centers to create more quality jobs. And then our uh, last uh, early 2023, the PASPAS Pilipinas PASPAS uh, project was launched. Essentially, this is in line with the ease of doing business law. Uh, the project uh, provided some LGUs with computer units you know, in, uh, with the aim of uh, streamlining and digitizing business-related documents. And this initiative is seen to accelerate the establishment of uh, EBOS or um, the Electronic Business uh, uh, business One-Stop Shops or EBOS. In terms of financial inclusions, um, uh, there's the National ID uh, system, which is non-transferable, uh, and unique and is viewed as a vehicle to facilitate the future rollout of state-led assistance. So uh, on the next slide, the question, the, uh, we go to the question, what, what's the, what are the evidence? What are the critical issues? So we note that based on the book chapters, we're synthesizing this, um, despite enabling um, policies and programs, various factors impede the growth of the digital economy in the country. Uh, and there are four major themes that we have identified. One would be the poor digital infrastructures, um, which essentially constrain uh, the development of smart cities and explains why the country's lag in digital transformation. Uh, the unreliability of connectivity and the high cost of internet also comes into play here. Um, the lack of capital, so with respect to fintech, um, one of the book uh, chapter, one of the chapter uh, chapters uh, identified limited capital available for startups, and another chapter uh, had discussed that for smart cities development uh, that require high development and operational cost, the, but there is limited technical and funding support at the local government. There's also the trust issues and data privacy concerns. So with respect to fintech, distrust in using technologies and in smart city de uh, development, safety and security issues on data and electronic transform uh, sorry, transactions. So just an aside, the Data Privacy Act has, uh, we have the Data Privacy Act and it, it has comprehensive guidelines for protecting personal information. But there are issues on the Data Privacy Act because uh, accountability, uh, accountabilities are unclear and the, the 
there, there's so many restrictions in terms of uh, using the information, which can ham hamper the, its productive use. And, and that's also one, um, uh, one uh, articulation that can be found in one of the chapters. So the, the fourth would be lack of skills, knowledge, and tal talent. So this is an over, this is a theme that has uh, come, um, that has figured into uh, almost 50% of the chapters in the book. Uh, shortage of fintech talent uh, for smart city development, the lack of um, skilled IT workers who will maintain and manage systems in smart cities, in general, low digital adaptability, um, and in platform work, poor negotiation skills and time management difficulties. In the countryside, inadequate written and communication skills that limit the participation among stay-at-home women, and the lack of knowledge on internet use that potentially limits e-commerce participation. So on the next slide, we note that there are socioeconomic divides and there are digital spatial divides and both can amplify each other. So with respect to socioeconomic divide, we know that poor and non-poor, uh, poor and non-poor, they have different levels of access to, le levels of access, exposure, and capabilities. Um, thus, there is a difference in ICT uh, utilization with respect to connecting to a mobile network, uh, affording an internet-enabled device, and or having the capacity to perform digital tasks. With respect to spatial divide, um, there is urban uh, rural disparity regional disparity in terms of the available infrastructures, tools, and resources. So both divides are mutually reinforcing. Uh, differences in ICT developments by geographical location can deepen socioeconomic divides. So for example, the non-poor can participate more in activities spurred by the uh, ICT. Meanwhile, those who have the abilities to invest in ICT skills are drawn to develop, uh, to are drawn to, to migrate to develop uh, uh, cities, to big cities, uh, leaving the less able in less connected parts of the country. So the lesson here is clear. People need to be on the right side of the divide to fully harness the benefits of the digital economy. And so some of the findings from the book chapters are flashed on the screen right now. So on the next slide, we note that uh, the non-standard work arrangements can make achieving decent work for all more difficult. So jobs in the digital economy have risks, uh, which have affect the attainment of de decent work. So when we say decent work, these are opportunities that are productive and deliver a fair income, security in the workplace, and social protection for families, better prospect for personal development and social integration. Um, but there are some types of online work that are susceptible, uh, susceptible rather to exploitation and mental health risks. For example, exposure to harmful content, <clears throat> And then there is no uh, employer, uh, employee relationship. Workers are not covered and protected by the labor code. And this results in income insecurity, the lack of social protection, and absence of social dialogue and workers' representation. So zooming in on uh, social protection issues, we there, uh, there's a chapter in the book that found that women are more likely to participate in platform work. Um, Platform work is often done alongside uh, non-platform work, which is typically the source of a platform worker's social protection. However, women's labor force participation is historically low, and many women are in the informal sector. In addition, coverage gaps in rural areas exist because most breadwinners are men, and therefore the finding is that these may depend the gender disparity in access to social protection. In addition, the social security uh, system uh, system has programs to cover voluntary uh, contributors. So, but there are uh, issues on the uptake of this program. One is budget constraint because people, uh, which go to the heart of short term and intermittent nature of platform work. Uh, and then um, and there's also the uh, negative view of social protection. Most people think that the contribution is a tax that lowers take home earning. And to some extent, there's also, also a problem of inadequate information of programs. So on the next slide, uh, we note that uh, there, there, uh, the dissemination of programs and initiative, initiatives is lacking. Uh, information to access financing and other support programs is important. Uh, and it's important because, for example, um, uh, enterprises, they are vulnerable to shocks. And information can help them adjust. 
uh, joining an e-commerce platform has costs that reduce the profitability and sustainability of small businesses in online marketplaces. And information on training and funding support is crucial. So the findings in some of the chapters in the book are flashed on the screen, essentially um, articulating the lack of awareness uh, of most stakeholders of efforts uh, of the government and uh, of the government. So at this point, I turn over the floor to Manette to conclude the discussion on critical issues and to provide the ways forward. Manette, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Connie. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to continue our discussions on the critical issues, there have been effective uh, public-private partnerships but the lack of coordination and collaboration among government entities results in the slow progress of digital transformation initiatives. In the case of smart city development, for example, inadequate collaboration has led to the lack of interoperability of systems. At the local level, systems work in silos and each project has its own data collection and storage method. Uh, it is the national government's role to provide the standards, policies, and guidelines in PPPs, infrastructure development, financing, and knowledge sharing. Moreover, it, sh it should craft a regional or national framework. Uh, without this, the efforts of the local governments will lack co uh, consistency and coherence. Next slide, please. There are also uh, issues related to the inconsistent application or delayed implementation of laws. Ownership of mass media is restricted to Filipino citizens. Based on how mass media regulations are interpreted, there is a risk that all internet and informational platforms will be categorized as mass media. Currently, foreign platforms remain operational in the Philippines but there is no guarantee that they will not be subjected to various penalties in the future. Weak and inconsistent enforcement increases uncertainty, while blanket prohibitions prevent foreign e-commerce and other digital platforms from entering and investing in the country. Uh, in addition, the implementation of laws promoting seamless transaction with the government has been slow, reducing the impact of uh, initiatives and affecting the delivery of other digital services. Examples include the rollout of the National ID System and the Ease of Doing Business Act, uh, requiring automation of business permitting and licensing systems. Next slide, please. So what can be done? Uh, I will now highlight the various interrelated recommendations. Next slide. Uh, the first is to strengthen the foundations of the digital economy. The government must continue policy and regulatory reforms uh, and invest in specific network segments as needed to improve internet connectivity, especially outside urban centers. Venture capital to support startups must be made available. Funding and technical support must be provided to LGUs to assist the, uh, in the development and operational costs of smart city development. And there's also a need to resolve the uncertainty in foreign ownership restrictions and remove barriers to entry and the expansion of digital platforms. Next, we must address the deficits in terms of human capital, updating the curriculum offered in higher education institutions is critical for various careers in the tech sector, women's e-commerce participation and smart cities uh, requirements. General upgrading of skills is crucial. The government can build on the Philippine Skills Framework Initiative and explore the creation of a commission on lifelong learning uh, to direct the country's strategies in line with the evolving needs of labor markets. Confidence in digital transactions and online market spaces is another important foundation of the digital economy. Alongside security and protection policies, regular information campaigns on fraudulent practices and cybercrime prevention strategies are helpful. The pool of cybersecurity experts could also be increased by providing scholarships and, intern uh, and internships for IT courses. Uh, next slide, please. 
The next set of recommendations focus on, focuses on digital policy governance. This applies to all types of initiatives. So digitalization requires visionary leadership at the national and local levels and the participation of various stakeholders. There must be a policy framework and strategic plan, especially for smart city development. Without a unifying framework, it has been largely supplier-driven or vendor-driven, exacerbating issues in data sharing, interoperability of systems, and data privacy and security. An integrated and holistic method is needed rather than the current siloed approach where individual departments build ad hoc applications. Moreover, collaboration and coordination can help ensure coherence and transform urban areas into smart cities. The process is also very important. It must begin with an analysis of digital readiness. Then policy formulation or program design builds on the analysis and must involve consultations with various stakeholders. We must make sure that institutions or, or organizations tasked to implement policy must have the adequate human and technical capacities and the right incentives to be, to be effective and efficient. They must be transparent and accountable. Then to determine if a policy or program is on track to deliver expected outcomes, monitoring and evaluation is needed. Okay, so the final set of recommendations is about modernizing policies and the regulatory environment. There is a need to review restrictive regulations and enable regulators to adapt to new technologies, products, and business models. Given the pace of innovation, the rigidity of existing reg uh, regulations, including mass media ownership restrictions, must be reviewed to balance the benefits against the risks. Regulatory sandboxes must be encouraged. Policies and regulations must be regu regularly evaluated. The regulator must understand the platform's characteristics as well as the business model and identify the specific public interest involved before imposing any new regulation if necessary. Since some platforms offer multiple products and services, and some form of digital regulation now occurs ac um, across different government agencies, a mechanism for collaborative regulation is useful. While there are regulators like the BSP and the SEC that can respond to innovation introduced in their sectors, other agencies may not enjoy the same level of authority, resources, or capacities. Legislative support is needed to enable regulators to adapt and to respond to potential harms without stifling innovation. There is a need to review current systems, social protection systems, to ensure decent work for online and other platform workers. This would involve updating the schemes to respond to the needs of new types of workers and work arrangements and encouraging participation in social protection programs through simplified registration and more accessible payment systems. Policies and initiatives on uh, public-private partnerships must be enhanced to consider the suitability of these arrangements for various technology and ICT projects, as well as education and training programs. Partnerships are also needed to raise awareness and promote digital adoption. Um, there's also a need to improve data collection. Evidence-based research and evidence-informed uh, policies rely on good quality data. It is important to ensure that definitions and terminologies are consistent. Also, um, consider the collection of data through um, innovative methodologies and the strategies to assess the contribution and needs of this emerging sector. Uh, okay, uh, next slide. So we've given you a broad overview of the book and we thank all the authors for their contribution. Uh, this is a compilation of the critical issues in various aspects of the digital economy. 
And as mentioned, each chapter assesses the current uh, situation and identifies three to five critical issues um, and the ways to address them. So I think in the interest of time, I, I will stop here. And again, thank you so much to the various uh, uh, chapter authors. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your insight.